Hi, welcome back on Stochastic. In the last couple of videos, we were looking into stochastic processes in general, and I kept showing you this one particular example without telling you much about it. Well, it turns out that specific example is actually a pretty unique stochastic process that is fundamental for stochastic calculus. It is called a Brownian motion. So what we'll be doing in this video is take you through step by step to understand where Brownian motion come from. Now, the first way to think about it is in discrete way, like these red lines that are easier to interpret. And this is actually pretty similar to something called a random walk. To know more about random walk, let's flip a coin. Every time we flip a coin, we can either get heads or tails. If we get heads, the stock goes up. If we get tails, the stock goes down. Let's look at it more closely. The first flip, we get tails, so we go down. The second flip, heads, so we go up. The third flip, heads too, so we go up. And so on. Mathematically, we can introduce the random variable attached to this random event. Let's call it xi. The expectation of xi is 0 and the variance is 1. But what we want to do is to look at the cumulative sum, not just plus 1 and minus 1. We can call it yn, which is basically the stock price. And this right here is what we call a random walk. The expectation of this random walk is the value we start at, so in this case 0, and the variance is equal to n. The main problem with this basic random walk is that it is discrete. You only get values at specific points like 0, 1, 2, 3, but nothing in between. But if you think about something like the stock market, the values there are defined continuously. As long as the market is open, you've got values changing every second, every millisecond. So this simple random walk doesn't really fit for a situation like that. This is where we introduce the idea of a scaled random walk. The idea here is instead of flipping a coin every second, we can do it much more frequently, let's say every half a second. Now, instead of having values at 0, 1, 2, 3, we have values at 0, 0 0.5, 1, 1.5, 2, and so on. And another thing that you can notice is that we are scaling it down by the square root of 2. We will get into why we use the square root in just a bit. Okay, so let's increase the scaling again by 2. So here, we flip the coin every quarter of a second. So 0, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75, 1, and so on. And we can keep going, scaling by 10, 100, 1000. And as we do this, you can notice that it starts to look very similar to what we have on the stock market. Okay, so here is the precise definition of a random walk. The mean between two time points is equal to zero, and the variance between s and t is t minus s. And this is actually why we were scaling by the square root of n earlier, because those values essentially cancel each other out. And if you want to simplify, you can also have s equal to zero. Okay, so let's do some simulations. Imagine we use a really high scaling, like 1 million. If we simulate multiple paths of this scaled random walk, you will notice something interesting. The distribution of these paths start to look a lot like a normal distribution. And in fact, we can actually prove that as n, the scaling, goes to infinity, the distribution converges to a normal distribution. So this brings us to one of the other parts of the video. To prove it, we need to use the L'Hopital rule. What we want to prove is that as n goes to infinity, the moment jettoning function becomes the same as for a normal distribution. First, we use the definition of the MGF. Then, we apply the property that the exponential of a sum is the product of exponentials. Then, we recognize that the mean is the average between the two possible outcomes, plus 1 and minus 1. Then, we see that this is equivalent to raising the same term to the power of nt. After that, we take the logarithm of the equation. Next, 
we do a change of variable. And finally, we apply a L'Hopital rule one time and another time. Okay, now that we have proved that, we can finally define Brownian motion first. It starts at zero, almost surely. And by almost surely, I mean that in probabilistic terms, it's as good as certain the probability of starting at zero is one. So almost surely is very common in probability. Secondly, Brownian motion is continuous, almost surely. So it doesn't have any jumps or gaps. And when I say it's continuous, it doesn't mean that it is differentiable. And in fact, Brownian motion is not differentiable. I like to think about Brownian motion being similar to the absolute value because the absolute value at zero is very sharp with a pointy edge, but for Brownian motion, it's like that everywhere. And of course, the absolute value is not differentiable at zero. And the third property of Brownian motion is that each increment is indefinite. So whatever happens in one time interval doesn't affect what happens in another. And the last property, probably the easiest one to visualize, is that the difference between the values at two different times follow a normal distribution with a mean of zero and a variance of t minus s. Now let's talk more about the last property. As the time difference between t and s get larger, the variance increases. This tells us that Brownian motion diffuses further away from the origin as time goes on. Essentially, the further you get from the starting point, the more scattered the value of the Brownian motion will be. All right. So next, let's talk about a couple of key properties of Brownian motion. One interesting property is that the expected value of Wt time Ws is equal to the minimum of t and s. To prove it, we can add to the equation those two terms that cancel each other. Then, we use the property of independent increments to separate the expectations. Based on this property, we can also see that the expected value of the square of wt is equal to t. And the same goes for the variance. So everything fits nicely with the definition of Brownian motion that we talked about earlier. Now, let's move on to something that's probably one of the most important foundation in stochastic calculus, and it's variation, and more specifically, quadratic variation. So imagine that we have a partition of time between 0 and t. The first type of variation that we can talk about is total variation, which is pretty straightforward. It is the sum of the absolute difference between each part of the partition, and total variation is just the limit of this sum as n goes to infinity. And alternatively, instead of thinking of n going to infinity, you can think about the norm of the partition called the mesh. It's kind of the same idea, just a different way of expressing it. Then, let's suppose for a moment that the function is differentiable. We can use the mean value theorem. And as the mesh goes to zero, we can see that if the function is differentiable, the total variation is equivalent to the integral of the derivative. Okay, now let's look at the quadratic variation. Instead of taking the absolute value of the differences, you square them. And what is really important here is that if the function is differentiable, the quadratic version is equal to zero. But this isn't true for Brownian motion. Why? Because Brownian motion is not differentiable. It is extremely erratic, unpredictable and volatile. The motion is so erratic that it actually accumulates variation over time. So when we say the quadratic variation of Brownian motion isn't zero, it's because of its extremely unpredictable and widely changing nature. To prove it, we first show that the expectation of the quadratic variation is equal to t. And then, we prove that as n goes to infinity, the variance is equal to zero.
This showed that the quadratic variation is always equal to t, not only on average. On the other hand, the total variation of Brownian motion blows up to infinity. Okay, so I just wanted to show you four properties of Brownian motion. The thing is that if you modify pure Brownian motion in a certain way, you can actually obtain another Brownian motion. So I'm not going to prove it, but you can get some intuition by looking at those animations. So here you have the property of symmetry. Then you have time inversion. Then scaling invariance. And finally, time reversal. Alright, to end this video, let's talk about something called geometric Brownian motion. Think of it this way. Imagine you have a stock that's worth, say, $100. The daily variation might be around 1% or 2%, so the price changes by $1 or $2, maybe even just 50 cents. But now, if you have a stock that's worth $10,000, that same 1% or 2% variation means the price will change by $100, which is much more significant, right? So the thing is, if we want a good simulation of how the stock behaves, simple burning motion doesn't quite cut it. That's because the change in value needs to be proportional to the stock price. If the price is very high, the changes should be larger. If it's lower, the changes should be smaller. And this is where geometric Brownian motion comes in. Instead of just saying that the change in the stock price, ST, is the same as the change in Brownian motion, we make the change in ST proportional to its current value. So, if ST is bigger, the change in DST is also bigger. This gives us a more realistic model. Now, when you think about this differential equation, a natural solution that may come to your mind is something exponential, but we can also modify this a bit by adding a few more elements. First, we have a term with sigma, which represents volatility. If the stock is very volatile, sigma is very high, meaning the stock price fluctuates more widely. Then, we add another term that's called the drift. This is super important because it accounts for the general trend of the stock. For example, during economic expansion, stocks tend to go up, so the drift is positive, but during a recession, the drift is negative. So with this model, we've got two key components. On one side, we have the drift, which reflects the overall direction of the stock. And on the other, we have the volatility term, which shows how much the stock price bounces around. Now, with this geometric point in motion, we can run simulations. And also, finding the solution for ST is really important, but we'll see this in the next video. Alright, thank you for watching and see you in the next one.